Hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Alex Stamos, and this is my name is Alex Stamos, and this is attacking web services. Is that a good volume for you guys? Okay, great. Um, this is a session from 11 to 12:50ish. We'll probably run a little bit early, um, but we'll be I'll be available for Q and A afterwards. My email address is in here, um, so at any time, please feel free to drop me an email. Um, also, I want to make this an interactive thing. It's really hard to judge, especially when you do like background information, what people's backgrounds are. So please raise your hand, or if I don't notice, just yell out a question uh, if you have it any time during the presentation, okay? Um, so I was joking about the whole Cisco thing. Obviously, Cisco doesn't deploy any web service boxes, so fortunately. Um, so what are we going to talk about? I'm going to talk about who I am. Uh, my speaking partner, Scott, was supposed to be here. He did a lot of this work. I need to give him a shout out, but I, I let him go to his engagement party so he doesn't get divorced because of DEF CON. Um, so we talk about what we do, what web services are, where they're being used. Uh, talk about the basic technologies and new attacks that we're now seeing in the deployment of these technologies, uh, as well as traditional attacks that we've lived with for a long time. Uh, especially, you know, traditional web applications uh, that now can be retooled a bit to work in the uh, web services XML world. Uh, and then we'll be doing a, a couple of demos. So it looks like the network's up for now, so we should be able to do a couple of those. If you want to play along, there's an URL in here. Uh, you can start downloading our software off the, uh, the web and the 19 different Python packages you need to make it run. Uh, and if, you, if somebody actually gets it running, you can play along while we do the demo. Uh, and like I said, please interrupt at any time if you guys need something. Um, so who are we, or I, my founding partner of ISEC Partners, uh, we're all ex-stakers, all wounded children from the at-stake semantic merger. Um, based on the West Coast, we do consulting and research, uh, mostly in application security. Uh, why, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're talking about web services, and why is that important? Well, they're deployed all around us, and it's kind of this stealth deployment that a lot of people don't realize, uh, especially a lot of people in the security community. Uh, if you're in the enterprise security community or if you're an enterprise developer, I'm sure you've heard the term SOAP or XML um, from a manager uh, or had to buy a book about it. Uh, but it's not something that there's been a lot of security research in. Um, so, you know, we're not saying that this is, th this is th definitely not the definitive talk that's going to be given on web services over the next decade. This is the first run through. Um, we found some bugs. There's some interesting stuff going on. But really what we're trying to do is create interest about web services in the security community and kick off research by other people because there's a lot we don't know. There's tons of acronyms out there that need to be attacked. Uh, and we're looking for your guys' help. Uh, so like I said before, the latest version of these slides is that the CD is way old. Um, isecpartners.com slash defcon.html. If you go to isecpartners.com, you can click all the way through. Uh, speak engagements. And then there's a demo web service at wsdemo.isafpartners.com slash expath service slash expath service dot ASMX. Uh, I will concede right now that there's somebody in this room with a botnet that could destroy this machine and make the data center itself fall into the gaping maw of the earth. And I concede you're a bigger man than I. Please don't sin flood it or anything. Uh, I'd like people to be able to play around with it, okay? Uh, so this talk is supposed to be not only talking about the security stuff, but we're going to try to do a, a background on the relevant technologies because, like I said, a lot of people, especially in the security community, haven't been exposed to them yet, right? It's not something uh, that you get off a CD. It's not something that ships through Dell. It's generally not something that you can download off a of BitTorrent, and therefore it's not something that gets researched very much, right? Um, and so we'll give a little background on that. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions because I don't want to spend too much time on that, especially for the people here who are experienced in web services. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the security risks uh, that are associated with web services. Uh, a lot of them sound pretty much familiar because a lot of technologies are familiar or built upon older technologies. Um, but there's lots of different things. And like I said, I think there's going to be a lot of stuff in the next several years, both attacks enabled through web services at, at, at applications that are insecure or in the frameworks and technologies themselves. This is not a talk about the WS-security standards. Um, that, that's a class of standards that does like encryption, allows you to do authentication and authorization, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're pretty interesting. They do all kinds of stuff. They come in books 700 pages long. Nobody deploys them. Uh, so that's one reason not to talk about them. But they're also about things like being able to do uh, legal signatures online using a web service, which has nothing to do with actually attacking or defending that application. Just because you have XML signing digital signatures enabled doesn't mean you can't attack it. 
right? Just as if you have SSL on your web application and there's a little lock in Internet Explorer, it doesn't mean your application is secure. It's kind of the equivalent. So this isn't a talk about that, which is good because you people would leave. So what are web services? It's a very overloaded term, mostly because you can get millions of dollars thrown at you by venture capitalists if, you're, if you put the words web services and Indian programmers like in your prospectus. For our purposes, web services, our communication protocols are based on XML. Um, that's pretty much the only standard we'll be talking about that's, that's universal. Lots of people do all kinds of weird web services, not like SOAP or any definitions, but just moving XML files around using HTTP or, or even SMTP, and they call it web services. That's fine. But the, for our purposes, we're talking about XML as the base language. They provide computer-to-computer -computer communication, which is an important point to understand and kind of underlay lies a lot of the security issues is that these are things that are not meant to cons be consumed by human beings, at least not initially, right? It's not like moving HTML over HTTP where the, the goal of the HTML is to be rendered into something that a human being can read, right? A web service might, you know, be rendered into a GUI or something, but maybe not. And a lot of the technologies are based upon the idea that human beings don't have to be involved, um, which is both scary for programmers who want to be in their jobs, but it's also scary from a security standpoint. Uh, they use standard protocols. They're often controlled by the W3C, OASIS, and WSI. Uh, web services as a technology has more acronyms than I've seen anywhere else. It is unbelievable. Um, it's not my fault. I just want to say that up front. Blame Tim Berners-Lee. And they're, they're designed to be platform and transport independent, although a lot of these standards have been made by like IBM or one standard has been made by Microsoft. All of them are generally accepted and patent-free and able to be uh, deployed by anybody. And that's kind of like what makes them powerful and makes them so uh, compelling. Um, why are they compelling? Well, you know, these web services are based upon some pretty well-understood technologies, right? How many people here have ever edited or created an XML file? Right, a lot of people, right? Um, that's great. That doesn't mean that you've done web service programming, but you now have a basic knowledge that a lot of people inherited from the HTML worlds anyway uh, to get into it. Um, uh, the, the adoption of web services has been very, very quick by large software vendors. The whole creation of these standard bodies has gotten rid of the not invented here syndrome, so Microsoft and IBM are willing to implement it without uh, either one of them taking credit for the other guy's inventions. That's a pretty unique in the security uh, or in the software industry. Um, one of the reasons they're compelling is that they're described as kind of a panacea for interoperability issues, both internal to the enterprise and externally, and we'll talk about some scenarios of that. Um, but probably why they're most compelling is the magic pixie dust, right? Uh, this is the same magic security pixie that comes by when you plug your computer into the wall at Caesars, and it automatically gets, a de it automatically gets an IP address, and then it's automatically able to talk to the, uh, the gateway, even though it doesn't know the MAC address for this crazy little PC dust protocol called ARP, right? It's all these magic PC dust protocols that make things happen magically and automatically and without human intervention that create insecurities, right? Because there's nothing secure about plugging into any network in the world, and that's because everything has always been built to be easy, and easy is bad, right? If there's not a human being involved saying, yes, you're allowed to do that, then that's a bad thing. And there's tons of magic pixie dust in this. For example, this is a little, what, 10 or 12 lines of C Sharp. Open up, anybody has MSDN installed, open up Visual Studio right now. If you create a new project, you point it at something that has a web server, uh, IIS 6 installed, and it's got ASP.NET activated. If you, you set up that project, you copy and paste this into a file, you compile it, it will automatically compile the C Sharp and CLR, create a huge, an ASM, an ASP page that corresponds with that C Sharp file, create a configuration file, create a web discovery document called a disco file, create a WSDL, which is the web service document language which we'll talk about, um, load all these up. If you have a UDDI server, it will automatically register with UDDI, and you'll now have a, you know, a, a function that if somebody over the internet can send them what message to IIS, which then hands it up to an XML parser, which hands it to a SOAP handler, which then finally hands it to your program, which gives it a string, and then it goes all the way back down, right, with 10 lines of programming. And there's then millions of lines of code running around it, which is, that's a lot of magic pixie dust. And that's the kind of stuff that we'll be talking about today. Um, and another reason that you see them all over the place is the value is really well understood by the, the point of here bosses. Uh, this is just a little fake quote, but this is, you know, something that we actually see, right? 
Um, I see a couple gray hairs and ponytails in here. So those are people that might actually know what Kix is. It's a crazy little programming language for mainframes. But you can't hire people that do it anymore, right? All those guys are retired uh, after all the Y2K money they made. And so a lot of these enterprises have these IBM boxes from the 70s that are all, their whole enterprises are running on. Now, it's their, their, their stock trading system or your health records um, or a, a bank, your bank account numbers, are all on a mainframe. And they can't hire people to talk to the mainframe. So what do you do? Well, you go buy some IBM products because IBM is able to take machines they sold in the 70s and continually make money off of them. You go buy an IBM product and some IBM global services guys, and they come over and they put some web sphere right in front of it, and they create the SOAP interface by which, just using XML and HTTP, you can talk to the mainframe. And now, I can get all these guys that have Learn Java in 30 Days books and have them write all my new enterprise applications to talk to the mainframe. Don't need to get any of those gray-haired pon ponytail guys. And that is very, very compelling to corporate management, right? Because they want to extend stuff and they don't want to spend money. So I have been told, I mean, this was all prearranged, obviously. Um, this is issue number 13, numbered, independent, I'm sorry. It's the last issue of FRAC, numbered 13. They're individually numbered. It's still warm from the printing press, and it's incredible leapness. Oh. And it will be given to somebody in this room today, and I have to come up with a competition while I'm talking to you guys in my head uh, about how we'll do that. So we'll have some kind of uh, hacking competition at the end. Um, let me think about how we'll do it. But pay attention, because you'll have to do something with the slides, okay? Please don't mob me. Slow down. There's a lot of security guys here. I know you want it, but put it here so you guys can, can look at it. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk about web services are being used, right? Where are you going to run into it? Like I said, Web services are not something that you consciously run into like you run into uh, RPC and Windows, right? If you're a hacker and you use Windows and you've ever done a file transfer, you probably understand, like, ports 137, 139, and Samba and stuff. It's a technology you run into. But a lot of people in here have not run into web services, even though most likely everybody in here, either your credit report, your social security number, your tax information, your bank information, it's been moved over a web service uh, protocol at one time or another. Um, so where are they being used? Between companies. This is a big, a big mover. This is the whole B2B thing, right? Uh, which meant business to business. Then it meant back to banking after the, uh, after the dot com boom, but uh, bust. But now it means business to business again, and people are doing this using web services, right? That we got a pass not invented here, so you can get your vendor to support it, and it gets rid of these stupid protocols that people invented. I mean, they're not stupid, but these incredibly complex dense binary protocols like EDI and stuff and all the X protocols that people have talked from company to company, uh, you can get rid of those. And now you can write it in nice and easy XML. You can read it in English. Uses HTTP. Everybody knows how that works. It's based upon a web browser. Much easier for people to use than these old protocols to talk from business to business. A great example, the credit card companies have these weird binary packed ultra small formats for doing credit card clearing. Well, they're also moving to doing web service stuff. So the credit card clear, when your, your order comes in, can talk to the bank, which can talk to the credit bureau, which can talk to the lender, and all this can happen over SOAP, and you can write it all in Java, and you don't have to buy a specific product for the credit card industry. You can just buy WebSphere or ASP.NET and write it on top of that. Um, internal to the companies, a lot of people like to hook their stuff up, right? I want my payroll system to work with my inventory system. Uh, web services to connect those, instead of people having to understand each other's formats. Uh, in front of legacy systems, I already told you about this. Um, mainframes, AS400s, all that kind of stuff. Between tiers of web applications, and this is a, a really interesting one for some of the bugs we're talking about, a lot of people are, are moving towards using XML, uh, an XML data format on the back end. So if you do something on a web application, that XML data goes somewhere. Now, it might go to an XML-enabled database, which can mean anything from a, a database that can understand XML and put it into a normal table, um, to being transported somehow and then eaten up by a, a, a a middle tier software or something like that. Um, this makes the X injections, and I mean X, X star, all, there's different kinds of protocols here, injections into those protocols very interesting. 
and the way that most of people have here. Who here has used Google Maps? Who here has used Gmail? Right, so you guys have used web services, right? Those are Ajax applications, uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, they don't use SOAP or any of like the heavy-duty web service, but it's still a web service. Uh, so really cool for people who haven't noticed, uh, these are applications that allow you to do all kinds of interactive stuff without reloading the page constantly, right? And it works. Uh, this was, Microsoft came out with Internet Explorer, has the ability to talk to what's called the XML HTTP object, um, and now Mozilla uh, now simulates that and stuff, even though it's obviously not ActiveX. But um, basically, I can give you an HTML page once. It has a bunch of JavaScript in it. That JavaScript talks to this object in the browser, which actually does all of its communication. And it's able to move XML files back and forth over HTTP. And it can do that without reloading. It can do it asynchronously. So it can do it multiple times, right? You scroll around in Google Maps, and it can spawn a bunch of these XML HTTP objects to load up the address separately from loading up the pictures to loading up this and that. And it gives you a great u end user experience. Um, a lot of people are using this in enterprises as a replacement for thick clients, right? I, if I don't want to use a, when SAP doesn't want to have to ship a, a, an end client for Macs and Linux and Windows, they'd rather ship something that just loads into Mozilla on all those platforms and allows you to have the same kind of user experience, which, you know, the user experience kind of sucked in web applications because of reloading the backbone and stuff, and you can get rid of that. Um, there are some definite interesting security issues with Ajax. Uh, a lot, we'll talk about that a bit. A lot of this stuff is also about the heavy duty protocols like so. So what's the point of this? Um, the code is broken free, right? One of the reasons what people like web services is you do lots of powerful stuff over one port, right? Because back in the day, everybody put their whole enterprises on the internet. Then they, you know, heard of this thing called a firewall, and they hired some firewall guys, and they paid Cisco some money, and they installed the firewall. And now, if you look at the outside of a normal corporation, you'll generally just see SMTP, HTTP, HTTPS, a uh, every once in a while a firewall one uh, management port, but you you don't see things like. Uh, you know, RPC open to the internet. Well, it's open to the internet again now, right? You're, you're moving it over a different protocol, but now with web services, you can move all this stuff over ports that people have had closed. And that's actually an advertisement for some of these products, right? Get around your firewall engineers. Buy our web service product. Um, so our new slogan is we poke firewalls in your we poke holes in your firewalls so you don't have to, right? Just set up your firewalls once, fire network engineers, add all your functionality to a SOAP interface, and you're done. So now we're going to talk about some of these technologies, give you a little background and the attacks with each. So XML. Uh, everybody here kind of knows what XML is. It's a it's this incredibly complex standard for representing all the data in the known universe, right? Which sounds like a really easy problem for them to tackle. Um, especially if it's supposed to be like English readable too, on top of it. Um, and it's very hard work, right? You got things like binary data, internationalization. Uh, XML has internationalization built in from the beginning, right? Unicode 1.0 is the standard for XML. With XML 1.1, it'll be Unicode 2.0. This makes internationalization attacks really interesting, right? Because we've seen these attacks before, things like non-minimal UTF-8 encodings, doing things like changing character sets to do like SQL injection and cross-site scripting. That's always been kind of stapled on because internationalization was stapled on to web apps. With web services, internationalization is from the beginning. And so if you talk to something that understands XML, it probably understands all those character sets. It, you no longer have to get lucky, like somebody installed the Japanese character set pack on the SQL Server, like you used to have to get. So that's that's a really big deal for internationalization attacks, which have been covered by other people, but definitely move over to web services. Uh, you have to represent meta characters. You have to be able to define and validate how these documents are, yada, yada. Because of the size of the product space, we've ended up with dozens and dozens of standards. Um, and very few people understand a lot of them, and there's nobody who understands all of them. Uh, which is a little different than web applications, right? Because it's pretty easy to understand both HTML and, uh, and HTTP. Okay, I can understand how those work. I mean, maybe I can't recite the RFC, but it's almost impossible to do that with web services. Uh, there's a couple basic strict rules. Uh, why do you guys care about it? Well, when you're attacking a web service interface, you generally have to use legal XML. Um, if you don't, you're just attacking the parser. And people have done that. People have written part things that do all kinds of wacky stuff with XML. But people have done that before, right? What we're trying to get to is the applications behind that standard XML parser. I'm not going to walk you guys through how this works, but here's a simple element in an XML tag, right? That's, that's called the parent node. Those are called children nodes. Here's a full legal document. It does things like define the encoding. Uh, this is obviously a Latin character set one for us English speakers. Uh, the default encoding for XML is UTF-8, which is great. Uh, this is the definition of a namespace. This XML document belongs to this namespace, so you can like 
if I had manufacturer or shouldn't overlap with somebody else's namespace of an XML document, I also define a schema by which this can be, these URLs aren't real, don't try to go grab them, um, a schema by which this document can be verified. Uh, schemas are the way you verify documents. DTDs are the old way. It was a non-XML base. There's this weird thing with colons and stuff. Uh, the great thing with DTDs is there's a number of nasty attacks that have mostly been fixed. But as people come out with new XML parsers, they might be in there again. Uh, one of the attacks was to make a self-referencing DTD that could say, uh, oh, yeah, I define the type B. And then B t defines type C, which defines type B, which types E. And then E defines something that has a subtype A. And you can get the DTD parsers to infinitely loop. You could also reference things that are external to the DTD, but most of the things have been fixed already. Uh, XSDs, XML schema documents, are XML-based. They're the new way of doing it. Um, the important thing for security people to understand is that from a defense part perspective, XML schemas can actually be very powerful. From an attacker's standpoint, uh, nobody uses them, so who cares? Uh, like I said, they can prevent many of the attacks we're going to discuss. Um, so if you are on the defense side, think about validating stuff with a strong schema. Uh, and don't do stupid stuff like having the all tag and stuff like that. We'll talk about that later. This is a schema. Uh, it's pretty readable. The only interesting thing here is I have a restriction that I have an element called year. I'm saying it has to be an integer and it has to be between these dates. This means I can't do SQL injection, right, in the integer field. If I give it something that looks like a string, the XML parser itself is going to die before it get, ever gets close to the database. So here's a little bit of a protection. Most people don't do this kind of stuff. Uh, the magic pixie dust that we talked about generally doesn't include XML schemas. Uh, so parsing. So how do you, I get an XML document, how do I read it? There's kind of two standard ways. Both ways have security flaws. Uh, the first one is called SACS, uh, Simple API for XML, I think it is. Uh, this is a step-by-step -step stateless parser that expects you to store the state, right? It's kind of like a thing I say, go one more step, one, go one more step. Oh, you have children node? Okay, I want that child, I want that child, right? So when people use it, it's nice and it's lightweight, it's pretty easy to use, but uh, it's not very powerful. And it has the downside of, if you use a SACS parser, you have to track what data you've gotten, right? If I want to get out of that car, if I want to get manufacturer, I have to say car. Okay, I got car. I want the child name manufacturer. It gives me manufacturer, and then I have to store it in a, in a variable for myself, right? And there's an attack against that called XML injection that we'll talk about. And then the other one is, is DOM, Document Object Model. This is really powerful parsing. This is how most people do it in enterprise applications, and that turns out to be a bad thing from a denial of service standpoint. Because building, if I have a big XML document, what this means is it takes and it builds a data structure and memory that represents it, right? It represents all the nodes that are linked to all the child nodes. It's linked to this, it's linked to this. And each one of those nodes is a data object, you know, is an object in Java with its own, you know, uh, garbage collection and all the information that gets wrapped around any variable in, in Java. So DOM has issues with denial of service. And then there's always a really bad idea. People make their own parsers with like regex and stuff. Don't do it. You can get an XML parser for every language. There's no reason to do it again because you'll probably screw it up. So an attack against SACS, XML injection. So this is a situation in which if the attacker can control a string that gets put into an XML document. Uh, there's multiple ways this can happen. This can be an XML document that is standing in for like a database query. If I send, maybe it's my user login and it puts my, the login information I give it, and it puts in the XML document and hands it off somewhere else to get parsed. Or it could be something like a document I upload because I, that's how I upload data. Um, it could be a lot of things. But anyway, if I can control text in it, I, and it's not being input filtered, I can put more XML tags in there. So in this situation, we have a user record. Let's say this is a bank, and I've, and I've logged, I, I've created my user because I have a bank account, and so I go in and I now create my web user, and it asks me for something like my email address. And so when I fill out my email address, I give it an email address, and then I close the email tag, and I create a new email, a new tag called unique ID, and then I say the email again, this is for the parser. Why did I put this unique ID in here? Well, this is in a situation where perhaps I have some knowledge of how the XML document's laid out. I know that there's a unique ID child node in there that defines what my ID is. What my, my, my this is like a, a unique ID that's used by the application itself. And so with a SACS parser, if I was used, writing a SACS parser to read this, generally, and remember this is a fault with the application, not the parser itself. 
but we see it over and over again because people don't expect this, is you step through the document and you go to the user record and you say, give me the unique, give me the first tag. And it says, okay, tag is unique ID, value is this. And so I write it to a temporary variable. And then I say name. And I write that to a variable. And I say email. And I write that to a variable. And then I get to unique ID again. And because the parser itself isn't tracking the state, I'm just going through and have a switch statement that says when I get this information, put it into a variable. I overwrite that information and put the zero back in. So who do you guys think zero, user zero is on a web application? It's the admin, almost always, right? This is the same kind of, when you do SQL injection, you do or one equals one, it gets the first user in the table, and it always turns out to be either like the developer or an admin. It's the same kind of the problem. And so the SAX parser, if I step through like this and store it in variables, gives me a unique ID of zero. How do you defend against this? You can do an XML schema where you say you can only have one unique ID per user record, or you can use a DOM parser, uh, which you would specifically reference one of these, and it would probably check, yes, sir. No, oh, oh, I'm sorry. So this red, you're right. That's an excellent question. Why not do unique IDs here in the first place? This red area is the only part I control. So this is a web, I'm, I'm imagining this is a web form that's taking my information and putting it into an XML document where it stores all my information about my bank account. Does everybody understand that? So I can only control what's between these two tags because it takes my data and puts it in. And as you see, I have to do, I have to do the email twice so that there's not this hanging email tag out here, which will make it choke probably, right? So like I said, for defense, you can do an XML schema validation, uh, or you can use a DOM parser, or you can go through and check to make sure that you don't get multiple input. Um, this also works with XPath, which we'll talk about. So if I did this attack and somebody was trying to pull this information out using XPath, even with a DOM parser, it, the attack would probably work as well. So that, which takes us to XPath. Um, XPath is this very simple language by which people are supposed to be able to reference what's in an XML document. Uh, it's kind of a cross between direct listings and regex. Uh, XPath number one was supposed to be nice and simple. It has like 20 pages of, of, of documentation, the, the standard. XPath two is something like 300 pages, and nobody's read them all yet. So I'm not sure what's in it, but uh, it looks really scary, some of this stuff in two. But this, these attacks work on XPath one. So say this was our car example. XPath entries are something like, so I get this XML, this is part of it, I load it into a parser, and then I want to ask the parser for information from the XML document. And so one of the things I might ask for is, let's say there's a bunch of car nodes, right, in this document, it's a big list of used cars. I want to return all of the children of the node. XPath queries always return a list. It might be, it's like MATLAB or something. It, it might be a list of one item, but it always returns a list, which is really interesting because uh, if I just say car, it gives me all of them in a big list, all of these nodes. If I return, if I do slash car, that just gives me the, the root element, right? Only the fir first one. Uh, if, if I do slash slash car, it does all the car elements in the document. I'm sorry, car, if you say just car, it's all the children of the car. Um, car slash slash color will give me uh, all the, the color underneath car. And then the interesting ones when you can have conditionals, Give me search for car and give it to me the list of cars where color equals blue, right? And you can actually do pretty complex queries in here. And as you can see, this is really, really cool, right? Because this makes it really easy to get information out of an XML document. Because uh, this is a pretty easy to understand language. And if my document's not incredibly complex, this is much easier to use than doing all these, uh, you know, Python or C-sharp calls to the DOM parser. What's the downside? Um, well, we'll get to that in a second. So where do people use XPath? Um, people often use it to talk to databases. It's starting to replace SQL in situations where people are storing XML data in a database. Uh, all of these, X, XPath is supported by all of these database servers. Uh, I think you need like SP3 or something for 2000. So, so what's the problem? Uh, well, like our old friend SQL from SQL injection, XPath uses, puts data, and the commands you want to do, it puts the verb and the noun right next to each other. And those are delineated by our old friend, the single quote, right? So if I want to say, give me the car where the color is blank, I use the single quote to say, this blank describes the car. That's not a command I want you to run. That's a description. Unlike SQL, there is no access control in XPath or XML documents. So generally, if you run an XPath query against an XML document, you can read everything in that document. That's good, right? Because Sometimes SQL injection just doesn't work because they have good database schema. Um, that doesn't exist here. There's also no real safe way of using XPath, right? A lot of times we'll do a pen test, we won't find SQL injection, we'll say, hey, no SQL injection, congrats, you must be doing really good input filtering. And they'll be like, input what? 
And we'll say, well, why don't we have SQL injection? Well, it turns out, because they want things to run faster, they use prepared statements, or they call in distort procedures, and that's a nice secure way of doing it, and SQL injection doesn't work in that case. There's nothing like that for XPath. There's no secure way to call it. The way people always call it is you concatenate a bunch of strings together, and then you give that string to the parser, right? Which is the bad way of using SQL. That's the only way to use XPath. So the outcome is if I can control any data that gets into an XPath statement, and I can get a quote in, I can return arbitrary data and access arbitrary stuff in the document itself. And here's the example. So in this example, say it's this bank again, and I've created an XML document. Uh, you know, I don't need a database, right, uh, because I'm a small bank. So I just keep a flat XML document of all my users. I've already been XML injected, so I fixed that, right? Oh, I'm so stupid. I should have known that people couldn't have gone stuff in. And so I fixed it by going over to a DOM parser, a nice big complicated parser that you can't do uh, XML injection against. But since it's so hard to use, I'm going to use XPath to get information out of it instead of stepping through it step by step. And so one of the things that I have to do is when people log in, I have to go see if they're in this big flat XML file of users. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Yeah. Great hypothetical, huh? Um, real original. So I'm going to create an, X, an XPath statement and then give it to my parser, and it's going to look up the user for me. And so I'm going to say slash slash user, search for the user whose name is equal to Joe and whose password is equal to let me in. And the two red things here are information that come from the web form, the login and the password field. Okay, that's fine. It works. This will return a list of all, of all the users, right? Because it's slash slash. It'll be a list of all the users that match that. Probably only one. It should be. But it does return a list, a list of one element. So now we come to our new canonical statement that will replace, if you're really, really cool, quote, who, who, what's the canonical SQL statement? This will be the first point for getting the book. Who, raise your hand. Yes, sir, back there. And then what after it? Right, dash, dash. And maybe semicolon, dash, dash, depending on it, right? So this is our new statement. Everybody memorize it, put it on T-shirts. Um, I have to get money from the T-shirts. But I've actually seen that life on T-shirts, which is horrible about me and my social life. But um, This is our new canonical statement that will tell us if, if XPath injection is working. Single quote or one equals one. Hey, that sounds familiar. Or single quote, single quote. That's not a double quote. That's two single quotes. Equals one single quote. I, I know you, not everybody can see it, but download the PDF. It'll be in there. Um, so what this does is now I have give me all the users whose name equals Joe, and my first single quote closes out the Joe string, or one equals one, which is a cylinder. What's the word for something that's always true? Topology. Uh, it's a topology. Something that's always true. So this always returns true. Or quote quote equals quote quote. Why why do I why do I need that quote quote equals quote? Anybody? To get rid of the last quote, right. So I don't have, XPath doesn't have the ability to do comments in line like SQL. So I can't use the dash dash, which we used for SQL injection to throw away the rest of the, the line, or a semicolon to make mine a statement and then make the next one a different statement. I have to actually use what's in my application. And so the easy way to do that, I've got a single quote floating out there, is I create an empty string, and then I create another empty string using that single quote. So only the red stuff I control, that last black one is put in there by the application, but I neutralize it by doing this. And password let me in. So why does this work? Because it's an or, or, and. Anybody? Why, why would this work? Well, the end's not quoted out. The end's, the end's used, but sorry. Operator president. Somebody took a first year CS class and hated it. Right, sir? Yes, operator precedence. The thing that bites you in your ass when you start CS. When you look at this, it first does the and. There's a implied parentheses around this. So the and is the first thing. Quote, quote, and pass equals let me in. So this turns to a not. But then we have false or true or false, which turns into true. And so what this does is returns all of the users because it's a topology. It returns a list of all the users. Well, what use is that? Well, like I said, XPath, everything's a list. So if I'm using XPath to log somebody in, I have to take a list, and what do I have to do with it? Well, not, not to protect, but what do I have to do like just to use it normally? I have to ask for the first element and then use that as the login, right? So I just ask for the first element anyway, and the first guy who's returned becomes my login user. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? A lot of people 
yelled at me at Black Hat because they're like, how could it work? Because it returns multiple things. Well, you know, unlike SQL, in this situation, everything is a list. So I, I'm going to take this output and ask, what's the number one guy? And use that person, the first child. Thank you. So if we want to get all super powerful, we can do things like now change and put more stuff in there. This is obviously much more useful if you have access to information with it. You know how the XML is laid out. So this is a open source or a commercial product that you can get your hands on and you can figure out how the XML is laid out. Um, and we can do things like create more rules and change around the statement to do all kinds of cool stuff. And we'll do that. I'll show a demo of that later. So what's a, like, like SQL injection, you know, this requires some knowledge of the query, which makes it much easier if error messages are on. How many people in here are going to vote that def that they don't give you all the information by default in all the major web service stacks? Anybody want to take that bet against me? I'll give you 10 to 1 odds. Nobody. Okay, that's true. The default is give them all the information they need to make an XPath query, and we'll show you on the default ASP.NET. Um, even if you can't get access to it, uh, Amit Klein, who used to be of Sanctum, I guess he's not there anymore, which is now Watchfire, which is now probably today it's VeriSign, and tomorrow will be part of Time Warner. I don't know what's going on in the security industry while I'm here. Um, but he wrote an excellent paper called Blind XPath Injection. Drop that into Google and you'll find it. He claims he has a way of getting the entire XML document out bit by bit by creating a conditional that's set on what the next character is. And so whether you log in or not is that one bit of covert channel you get out. Of course, it, like they had like a test of like there's 40 characters after and it took like two hours to get those 40 characters out because you have to do all the logins and test all possible characters, but it's pretty cool. Um, if anybody knows him, I'm trying to find him. Have him release the tool, please, so we can play with it. Um, but XPath 2 might give us a lot more ways of actually getting all that information out. Uh, XPath 2 does a lot of cool things, like you have the ability to reference outside documents. I can, make, I can have tests that ask for information from an outside document, right? Like if this user is equal to the user in this. Now, the control of where that outside document comes from isn't really defined by the standard, right? That's going to have to be up to the people that write the, 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 product, the implementation themselves. So how many people want to bet that at some point you're going to be able to get a, a document from your web server? Right? And that way I'd probably be able to leak a bunch of information out about the rest of the XML. The future, if you guys want to be really, really elite and get the next t-shirt before this t-shirt comes, this can come out after this t-shirt, is xQuery injection. xQuery is a, a superset of XPath that is now the standard for talking to XML databases. Um, and one of the really cool things it can do is you can reference a bunch of different documents and stuff. Um, downside is now people are actually building access control and so boohoo. Uh, we won't be able to read everything, but that hasn't stopped us with SQL injection, right? Um, and in this attack, and in a bunch of other attacks that we're talking about, our big friend is the C data field. So I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but it's basically just a way that XML has built in to get nasty stuff in the XML, right? Things that XML that you don't want it to interpret as part of the XML document, you put it in the C data field and it disappears. So I can put things like with single quotes and with uh, brackets and all that kind of stuff into a C data field, and that goes into the XML parser, and then when you ask the XML parser for the string, it gets rid of that C data field for you. So the application never sees that you did that. There's also other escaping methods that work just as well, but the C data field is so powerful and easy, it's the best way to do it. Once again, XML schemas for defense. You can turn off C data fields in XML. Oops, that was back. So any questions on the XPath injection? And it shouldn't be X squared. Okay, I'm going to demo that at the end, because uh, it's the cool one. Um, so SOAP. SOAP is a standard where all of these like really cool web service stuff, this is where a lot of the magic exists. Um, it's a standard that defines, I move XML around, that I can do remote procedure calls. I can do RPC calls. Um, it's generally over HTTP, but it doesn't have to be. SOAP is defined by things called WSDLs. WSDLs are these really ugly documents that are never meant for human beings to read. They're meant for computers to read, and they're generated by computers. And the great part of them is that as an attacker, as somebody who's scoping out an application, the WSDL tells you everything you need to know to attack the application. So this is so much more powerful than we had for uh, web application hacking, right? Because to do a web application hack, you have to start off playing with the application for days, using a user trying everything, and then mapping it out and seeing all this functionality it has, right? With web services, they just tell you up front. They tell you, these are all the things I can do. These are all the things you can ask me to do on your behalf, which is really, really cool, and it makes a lot of things a lot easier. Um, generally, asking for a WSDL is as easy as adding a question mark WSDL at the end of, an, at the end of a document. And we have a tool that will do this automatically for you so you don't have to go through and do question mark WSDL over and over again. 
Um, they define all this stuff. This is just for reference. You guys don't need to know. Basically, it defines something like if I, if I had a service that sold used cars, it would define how I ask you to sell me the car and then your response to me and what that means. Uh, there's no way you can read this. It just This is like a third of a single WSDL for a very simple eBay thing. It's incredibly complex and, and dense. What, what's good about that? That means that the developers that wrote that almost certainly never read the actual WSDL, right? The WSDLs are generally automatically generated. Like my thing I wrote before, if you write a bunch of stuff that's accessible through web services and you turn it on, all of a sudden the WSDL's generated that tells, that tells somebody all those things so that they can point a web service at it and not have to talk to you about it. That's the whole idea. Um, and so that often includes things like hidden debug messages. And I've actually seen this. This is a web application that was ported over to having web service support. And they had ported over all of their functionality, right? I think uh, it had been on struts or something. And they ported out all of this functionality over to web services. And one of the methods in the WSDL that obviously they had never read was make me admin. It was a, a debug call that a, a, a database uh, that the ad... Uh, the developers would have just normal low rights users could make that call and they'd become the administrator of the, of the service, right? Now, they had had that in the web application before and it had never been attacked. Why? Because it was a, a, a parameter you had to put into a post. And that's not something that pe somebody might not, you know, make me admin might not be something that you guess and that you shove into every single parameter in every single post. But I didn't need to try anything. All I had to do was look at the WSDL and it said it right there. Make me admin takes, uh, it takes like a user ID for which admin you want to become, right? Um, that has always existed, and now it's just really, really simple. There's also all these cruft systems. Who here knows of like a 1 a.m. batch FTP job that they're embarrassed about, right? Come on. Yeah, right. It's unbelievable what's transferred over FTP in the middle of the night. Like if I was a router engineer, I'd be all over it. Um, all this kind of stuff's getting moved over web services. Nobody's ever thought about security for them before. Maybe they've been kind of hidden because you have to be on the right router at the right time to get the information. Now all you have to do is ask. And you can use something like UDI to say, hey, tell me all of your secret services. We'll talk about that. So what's your defense? Uh, you can manually review the WSDLs. Everybody should know what's in their WSDLs that they're broadcasting in the world to make sure there's nothing in there that's supposed to be a private function or that you're really embarrassed is in there, like debug functionality. Um, you can hand edit them. Like Google writes theirs by hand, I think, mostly for compatibility issue reasons. Um, but the better part is don't have things like make me admin in your production app. Right? Get rid of that before it gets out to production. So there's a number of different attacks with SOAP. Um, one big one we'll talk about a lot, uh, well, not a lot, but we've got a couple slides on, is denial of application-level denial of service through XML complexity. And SOAP obviously takes XML, but you're probably wondering, you know, obviously I probably can't give SOAP arbitrary XML, right? Because maybe a method only wants, it says, you know, buy a car, and all it takes is the VIN number. It takes one string. How do I shove arbitrary XML into that one string? Well, these fun things called SOAP headers. SOAP headers are part of the message that almost nobody ever uses, but everybody listens to and reads. And they're there because, you know, all these things like WS routing and uh, all the encryption standards and stuff use them. You can put arbitrary XML in a SOAP header because there's no definition of what can and can't go in there. And that gets read and parsed by the application. Um, there, you can also do some source routing sometimes. Sometimes people have multiple applications they're exposing through web services, and so they have to make a decision on where, who you talk to when, when your message comes in. Well, sometimes that decision comes from the header, and that can be set by the application itself. If this is like a client that you downloaded or something. If you see something that looks like routing in the header, try other things that sound like they might be web service inside the application and see if you can get it bouncing off of different things on the inside. SOAP is, has a lot of session management problems. It doesn't have session management. Just like HTTP, it's, it's, you do a post, you get, you get a response. That's it. Um, that means people have to develop their own session management. A lot of people do s dumb stuff, like they use cookies, right? HTTP cookies, they still work. Obviously, it's on a browser on the other side, but somebody has to understand it. Well, what happens to that cookie once it hits the web server? It's stripped off, right? Like, this XML document's going somewhere. It's going to a mainframe. It's going to a database. That cookie doesn't go with it. And so this causes a lot of access control problems for people because they're setting these cookies and they never see them actually where they're making decisions like whose bank account can you transfer money out of, right? Um, so, you know, that's an issue. There's also all the old classical state issues. A lot of people have to implement their own state mechanisms. They haven't had to do it for years, right? They've been able to use WebSphere's or ASP's little cookie. So they're kind of old at it and they don't remember that doing things like counting up from 1,000 
and to making the next user user number 1001 in that field is, is definitely a little bit guessable, right? As are things like counting up from 1,000 and doing a SHA-1 or something like that. So we see that all the time again with web services because people have to roll their own. So this is a soap message, yada, yada. It's kind of generic. Uh, you don't want to be actually writing these by hand. They're really hard to write by hand to make them accurate. Uh, and we'll sh I'll show a little free tool that you can download that does all the communication itself. Remember, we don't have a web browser here, right? When we're talking to a web service, it's expecting another computer to talk to it. So we don't automatically get something that has a GUI on it uh, to put information in. Um, and then you'll see in the demo, there's this thing called soap faults. If something breaks, it sends a fault back that has a string. So who here finds the inter can find the interesting part of this? All right. So what do you think this is here? What does that look like that we've just talked about? That looks like an XPAC, XPAC query. This is the default functionality of ASP.NET 1.1 Service Pack 1. If XPAC breaks, tell the user. Tell the user exactly the XPAC string that broke and how it broke. So we'll, we'll, we'll demo all that in just a second. Um, and then something I talked about was web services develop service. Uh, this is, in my opinion, much, 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 much more powerful. I'd rather have a good XML attack than a thousand bots on a botnet to do a sync flood. Why? Because I have a huge, huge multiplier. I don't have a huge multiplier with a sync flood now that they've got, somebody's got $100,000 Arbor boxes or not really nice net screens or something on the other side. But I get a huge, huge multiplier with an XML attack against an application. And I have to look for this advantage. And often this advantage, well, we, we've explored two different types. We're not releasing the code because it works too well. But it's pretty easy to recreate it yourself. But you either do attacks against the, the parser itself or against the application and its database backend. And against the parser itself, you get very large multipliers of CPU time and memory, right? If I can send you an XML document, how, how hard is that for me to send you a text document, right? It doesn't have to be dynamically generated. I don't have to use .NET to create this document. I only have to write it once and send it with a Perl script. So I send it once. OK, that's a couple cycles. I can probably do a couple thousand of those a second. When it gets to the other guy, he takes that document and he says, OK, well, you want me to download a schema and you want me to set the namespace. Now I'm going to build a model that represents this document. So I have the head node, which is A, and I have the child node, that's B. Oh, and B has a child node called B, and B has a child node called B. And repeat that 100,000 times, and then close B off 100,000 times. And that guy builds an a, a, a object in memory in some heavy-duty language like Java or C Sharp, where it's not that, you know, memory management isn't that easy anyway. It uses a lot of memory. And it builds this huge object that's 100,000 objects long and deep. That is a huge, huge advantage. And all that happens before it makes a decision what to do with it, right? This is just the parser. The application hasn't even seen that anything's happened yet. This is the magic pixie dust framework that's done all this work for you. Gives you a huge advantage. How big an advantage? Well, we've taken down four enterprise, enterprise level hardware with a, a real patched good web services server with one of these laptops, right? CPU pegged them. Because, and I don't think the CPU was actually from the parsing as well as the memory management, uh, because every time a message came in, it would build that DOM, and then it would destroy that object, and then do it again and again. Because we can get a couple thousand queries a second, or a couple thousand a second out of some uh, 20 threads of Perl. So that is really, really powerful. And that's, you know, it, take, it would take a lot more than one laptop to sin flood those four boxes, right? Especially if they have a real load balancer. Requirement. The other attack we've looked at is database connections, right? Database connections are coming from a pool. There's a limit of how much they, they're, they're pre-created, and then they're used. And they're usually not like, even for sites that have millions of users, they're something like 200 or 500, right? Because they're only used when the query is going to cross. So like we said, this WSDL tells you all the things that it can do, right? And you can do all of those things. It's stateless. You can do all those things as many times as you want, generally, unless they're doing something very smart. And so what do I do? I go through this WSDL. I find something that looks like it, it's a very heavy-duty thing that it has to look up in the database. Somebody name a query in which you have to read a big table, and you have to do it every time somebody asks you. Login, right? If I log into a machine, it's got a big list of users, and I give you a username, especially if it's randomized and you don't have it cached, you have to go ask the database, who's this user? And so to create these user requests with random usernames and passwords over and over again is not very heavy duty. But it requires, it takes up one of these connections during while it's asking that question over and over again. And this is a great thing against enterprise servers because often, especially sites that have been DOSed before, they have 20 or 30 or 40 front-end web servers. How many database servers do they have? 
one or two in HA, or maybe two HA clusters, right? And that HA is probably cold failover, so they're not actually running. So, and, and it's not considered a fail, failure when you use up all the database connections, right? That doesn't mean the box is broken. It just means that the queue is filled up. And so we've also done this against an enterprise system where there's a ton of web servers in the front and two database servers in the back in an HA config. And with a couple of laptops, we, we choke the database server. The, C the database server only had like 5% CPU used, but that connection pool is all used up because we did something that took a lot of time. Why doesn't this get caught in normal testing? Well, in normal testing, you don't log in 100,000 times over a course of two minutes, right? That's not part of people's regression testing. You log in once and then you do the heavy duty stuff. And so that kind of application level attack, while it's been doable with web applications, is really easy with SOAP, right? Because the login, all I have to do is change a little bit about the particulars and maybe generate some random usernames and my Perl script has destroyed a database box. Um, in either case, there's some important things to remember. You have to have a legal SOAP request. Right? You don't want it thrown out before it hits the application, this especially in the database side. And then speed is very important too. Uh, we use multiple processes with multiple threads, um, but uh, you know, there, it is still a little heavy duty compared to like a sin flood. And obviously it, the, the attacker's uh, position is given away. So that's, that's a downside for the attackers. It's a good thing for the good guys, right? Because you have to use real TCP connections to move this stuff across. But you don't have to listen to that connection, right? You can make a connection, send them the post, and then drop it. If you're using your own TCP stack, then just stop listening. Don't send a reset. Let it respond, but you don't have to actually have that memory allocated to get the response. Makes it very, very efficient. We're also looking into ways to make it faster, like uh, HTTP 1.1 pipelining is especially important with like SSL because I don't want to do an RSA transaction for every post I do. If I do pipelining, I just send them all up with like create a pool of 20 or 30 TCP SSL connections and send them up. Or things like XPath. Everybody, anybody hear about those, those crazy regex attacks uh, that you can do denial of service by getting somebody to do a weird regex that's really, really hard. Well, XPath, obviously, if I can do arbitrary things in XPath, I can probably do things in my XPath injection that are really bad, even if I can't use it to, to, to own the application. Unfortunately, defense isn't very easy for this. For things like the SOAP header XML complexity, there's nothing you can do as an application developer in your application, right? Because like I said, the SOAP message comes in, even if it's not for you, you've never heard of it at your application. It's the web, it's WebSphere or it's Access Apache or it's ASP.NET that's doing it for you. Um, so the only defenses against that are something like you have an XML firewall. This is one of the reasons they actually sell a couple boxes a year um, that looks at this, looks at them and has limitations on it. You can set your own limitations. Like if you only do small messages, you use 50K messages, and you set that in Apache or IIS. Um, and so that's important. There's no reason somebody should be able to upload a 20 megabyte XML file to you, right? Um, or you can do something like write your own Apache filter or with something like Apache mod rewrite or mod proxy to look for this kind of stuff. Um, SAX is not vulnerable, right? Yes, sir. Uh, limiting rate from source IP. So you could do it from source IP. Of course, this is the problem everybody's running with other issues. In situations like an, an AOL situation, you might kill one of their 12 mega proxies, right? Or, you know, whatever uh, Nippernet has like 15 ways it gets out to the internet or something like that. So, I mean, you could rate limit by source IP. The, the way to do it is you need to make them do work to ask you. So you need to ask, have them ask you for a session ID. You generate a session ID randomly. No, don't put it in the database. Just generate randomly in memory. Give it to that person. And then have them send it back with the login information. And then you can check against the table in memory, which is much faster than going to the database. As for the XML stuff, uh, you have to put a protection in front that looks for the complexity and stops it before it gets to the web server. Either that's a firewall or it's your own thing. Oh, right, in size. Yes, I, I do recommend limiting size. If, if you never have anything larger than 50K, set it to 75 or something, um, most people, almost nobody thinks about that, right? And by default, all this stuff accepts up to like 20 or 30 meg posts and stuff. And that's when it gets really nasty, right? It takes a minute to, you know, it takes me 30 seconds or something to upload a 20 meg post over a 100 megabit connection, and then it takes a minute for it to parse it, right? So. XML firewalls are these, well, okay. So it's another, it's another venture capital term. So it's something that makes people venture capital. That's the, the basic definition. Generally, there are things that sell that look at XML 
They're like application level firewalls. Um, a lot of the XML firewalls aren't created for security purposes. They're created to do stuff like routing. So if I have multiple web interfaces, web services, I can just put one box in front of them. It's kind of like a load balancer. And it says, oh, you want to talk to the mainframe. I'll, I will send that information to the mainframe. Oh, you want to talk to this database. I'll send the information to this database. But they now, because of security issues, they do things like they'll check for the complexity of the document before it comes through and not let it through. So kind of like, you know, Synchton's app shield in front of web apps. XML firewalls or silk firewalls or web service firewalls or whatever, the, whatever gets you the most money right now, whatever they're called, um, look at the, the request and, and filter it for things that might be dangerous. They'll also do things like look for SQL injection and XPath injection and stuff like that. I can't always recommend them. I mean, for most, this is one of the only things that you can't fix yourself. If you have a SQL injection bug, fix it. Don't spend $100,000 for a hardware firewall that's now in your critical path that if it turns out they didn't do the right thing with their TCP stack, somebody can DOS it anyway and take you down network-wise, right? Or it's something you have to pay to maintain. Um, they're not some things that you can just, you know, drop in front of your app and expect them to work. So, anybody here sell XML firewalls? Obviously, we're not a vendor. <laughs> okay. Excuse me? Uh, I think Teros might do this kind of stuff. Forum systems, Sarvega, uh, Come up, somebody come up with a prefix and postfix for a, a startup company, and it's probably, there's like 20 or 30 companies that do it. Like I said, they're mostly do stuff like, I want to do encryption on my web service, I don't want to write into my app, so the box will do it automatically, stuff like that. So any questions on the DOS? Like I said, we're not releasing them, but it's pretty easy for people to recreate them. You just need to build really complex but legal XML. Um, and it can be, you know, com complex just means deep, right? If I have five root nodes that have 100,000 deep child nodes, right? It's not just the number of nodes, but it has to be the linkage between them for something like a DOM attack. Uh, that's a really, really powerful attack. It's pretty easy to recreate. Obviously, there's no reason for us. It would not be a very ethical thing to release that. Um, so discovery methods. We talked about whistles. Uh, I don't think we'll look at it. Talk about this real fast. Uh, UDDI is another great discovery method, like a WSDL, what I talked about, just defines one service, right? You ask for a service, how do I talk to you? How do you find th that service in the first place? Well, there's this great thing called UDDI, which lists all the services that somebody's running, right? So, yes, sir. Yeah. No. No. They will not load. People learn their lesson off the DTB attacks, and they will not load all. Uh, off-site XSDs, by default. Certainly, you can tell your XML parser that you want to, um, but, you know, I, I, I haven't seen anybody do that. Sure. Any other questions? I'm sorry, on the DOS stuff. Okay. Um, so you do the eyes away, I can list all these web services, and uh, you might think that nobody's deploying them, but I've seen a bunch of them, right? A lot of people are doing testing of web services right now, or they have two or three that their business partners use, and so they put a UDDI server, which is XML on top of HTTP. It's nothing very complex. There's a bunch of free Google for UDDI browser, and you can download free ones or use web applications that'll do it free for you. Um, and then they put these IP addresses out, and they tell their B2B partners, wow, you know, it's so hard to set up a VPN, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you our UDDI address, and then you guys can figure out how to hook up to them SSL is on, right? So use SSL. That's what we'll use instead of a VPN. And they expect people won't find these UDDI servers, right? Because if you do nmap-a, I think right now, it won't say this is a UDDI server, right? Because it's just a, it's just a port 80 to be out there, or port 443. Um, the great thing about UDDI is it tells you everything you need to know to attack a web service. Um, and it tells you, if an enterprise is deploying it, everything they're deploying. Now, they don't have to list everything, but like I said, some of this stuff automatically lists. If you have a UDI server, Visual Studio will automatically li list it up for you, right? Um, so how do I find UDDI servers? Well, IBM, Microsoft, SAP, and, and uh, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone have very kindly stepped in and given us a nice searchable web interface that tells you UDDI servers that people have registered. So you guys see this hierarchy here? The whole idea is that, you know, I should be able to do a web service with another company without ever talking to somebody at that company. So first I go to a UBR. I search, if I want to talk to SAP, I search for SAP. I see all the web services that they're listing. And, the, and I go to the, their, the UBR will tell me U, their UDDI server, if they have one. I talk to U, their UDDI server, and it has things like uh, invoicing, right? Maybe I want to do, I've sold them some stuff, I want to invoice them. And so it says the invoicing web service Who's, this is the contact information for that person. 
and it exists at this URL. And so I go to that URL, I add a question mark whistle, and the invoicing service tells me, okay, these are the nine things you can do with the invoicing service. And now I have the ability to do whatever I want to those different methods. So that's the tree, and that's how people envision it. Obviously, it makes things easy for businesses, but it also makes things easy for attackers. One of the really scary things is there's currently no real binding of somebody who's in the UBR really is that person, right? Like this next one, who here is going to trust this entry? Bank of China, right? There's no cryptographic protection saying this is the Bank of China, but here they are. They're listed in the UBR and with a, a character set that I can't read in my browser because I don't have the Chinese character set, right? Um, now, people are working on these big PKIs by which you can authenticate web services, but uh, people are fighting over the standards. Like, that, obviously, it's a lot of money. Just it's just a lot of money to be able to sign certificates for web, for web apps. It's, it's going to be a lot of money for web services because it's only corporations. It's very rarely individuals. Um, and so there's no good way of, of verifying this right now. So we'll do a little walk through a, a UBR. Microsoft has the, the prettiest interface, so I think I'll use theirs. Um, so fortunately, Microsoft puts up a big barrier to keeping attackers from using a UBR. Um, you have to be registered. What kind of registration do you think you need? A passport. So, I mean, if that restricts to all attackers with a Hotmail account, then I think we're, we're all okay. I'm going to sign in first so you guys can't um, razz me with how short my passport, passport password is. Are any of the passport guys in here? Passport's great, by the way. Are any of the passport guys here? Okay. <laughs> they're actually, they're some really smart guys, so. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about something while this is loading. What? Sorry? Oh, wait, a book. Excellent. Yeah, because this is going real slow. Somebody's tossing Microsoft on that one, probably, so. Um, okay, competition. Okay, the first person who can raise their hand and give me the new canonical XPath gets the prize. Yes, sir. Next. The next, the injection attack itself. The string. Yes, sir. It's not a semicolon. Okay, I'm going to close my eyes. Oh, no, I'm not close my eyes. I'm going I'm to say yes. Yeah. I'm going to say now, and then everybody raise their hand, and whoever's fastest. Oh, Jesus, there's no way to do this. Now. <laughs> okay. I think, I think this gentleman was up there. Bam! You are the winner, sir. What is your name, sir? Come on up. Get your prize. And he can't even see the slides. That is amazing. What, what's your name, sir? I've spotted the Fed. Mike, show them the shirt. <laughs> okay, I, that was perfect timing, Mike. Good work, because now I am logged into the UBI server. Now, I'm not trying to beat up on Microsoft. I'm just using them because they have the prettiest interface. Um, and you don't have to really register, you just use Passport, but as I said, those four companies all run UBR nodes, and they all sync up with each other, right? So this is the same data from all of them. So uh, we can do things like we can register ourselves as users, we can publish ourselves. Like I said, uh, when you publish yourself as Bank of America, nobody calls the Bank of America headquarters to make sure, right? A um, little information and stuff. Let's try the search field. What should we search for? Any... Chase, okay. Like a car chase, you mean, right? <laughs> um, well, another cool thing is they've got all these, well, it's not cool, it's actually incredibly boring, but it might be useful, is that there's all these different ways you can categorize these web services that are all competing. Like the government has some, and then the uh, Visual Studio has its own, all this kind of stuff. And eventually, when a lot of people are using it, you should be able to... Uh, walk your way down this tree and find all the things that are important. Finance, that sounds like an important one. So. Credit agencies and banks. <laughs> it's amazing how many 
like levels in here? Okay, they say there's none. Okay. That doesn't mean that they've actually categorized everything. <laughs> See where I search my name on this? Uh, maybe it's our production. You're right, you're right. So I could provide providers is like the, the English name of the company or enterprise or whoever it is. And I'm going to do something more general than Chase because I'm not sure they're in here. I'm just going to do bank and we'll see what happens. There's not a huge number of people because there's not a huge number of people deploying them publicly. Um, one of the things that our web WS WizMap, the, one of the tools that we're releasing, one of the functionalities we had to pull at the last minute. So, yeah, it's it's funny if you buy like a Learn Web Services book and it's got like an example how to do a UDDI registry. Search for that thing. It's going to be like Acme Bank or something, and there'll be hundreds of listings of all the people who have downloaded it and actually done it, which tells you something about them. So, Miss Matma Sharma uh, is the contact. Here's her email and phone address that I'm not going to click through, actually. But you put contact information in case you can't get all this magic pixie dust doesn't work and you actually have to call somebody. Um, this is saying that Bank of America has a lending service. Oh, it's a... Uh, and they use a local host. So somebody's just been playing around. So, but if port 18,000 is now something very interesting to put in your end map scan, right? When you look at the the Bank of America. But if this was, if they're actually, if they're actually exposing this, then this would be an URL to something that's internet exposable. And then there'll be interface. There's different ways of defining how an interface works. Um, let's see what their interface model is, it's called. Like I said, there's lots of acronyms. It's a T-Lender model. So at this place, if they're publicly doing it, you probably have something like an URL. I think Bank of America had a uh, WSDL URL. Ironically, not a bank of Lithuania. Awesome. Um, we'll have like a, an URL that goes to a WSDL that points you directly to. Oh, something I forgot to mention about WSDLs that were in the slides. A WSDL gives you everything you need to know to attach to a service. So that includes the location of it, right? So a WSDL text document, if it's just floating around, contains all the information like this is what you can do, this, this is how you log in, this is how you transfer money, and this is exactly where the URL is. So if you have a WSDL, you have everything you need to know to actually do the attack, right? Because the location of the service, uh, what platform it's running on, all that kind of stuff is, cont is contained in there. God, this is so slow. So anyway, everybody can go play with this when they're on their fast connections. UDDI.Microsoft.com, or you search for UBR, and you can play with other people if you have a, a preferred vendor. Oh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So at this point, well, I guess I'll show you how the discovery works if I was actually going to do something nice. Um, if I, you know, if I wanted to use a web service for legitimate purposes, there is a nice little program called uh, WS uh, Web Services Studio. It's distributed off of got.net.com, which is like the Microsoft community site for .NET developers. I think it's actually made by Microsoft but not supported, so they throw it on the cheap site so they don't have people calling the 800 number about it. Um, it's a great little graphical interface. Like I said, you know, web services, unless somebody gives you the client, or if it's something like an Ajax app, um, uh, you don't have a nice GUI way of talking to it. So it's a good thing for a developer. Yes, sir. Okay, right, and Eclipse has a web, well, a web service platform. I use XML Spy, which is really expensive, but there's all kinds of really cool stuff, too. Um, so, Web Service Studio. I think I've already gone to the bank. Oh, it's up there. So, this is the, the studio. Uh, it does things like, I, I, like I said, you put a whistle in there. It can either be on the internet and you ask for it. It can be local, and then it'll figure out where it is from the local one. Um, and I'm going to go back to the Bank of Lithuania, to the interest rate rates, details. Here we go. Here's the access point. ASM.ASMX, so what platform do you guys think that is? Windows, right? It's probably ASP.NET. Um, although web services are supposed to be universally work with each other, there's lots of little details, and so it doesn't always work. Uh, in fact, one of our tools, uh, 
you know, there's some problems with, I'll demonstrate. There's some problems with the Python implementation. One of the problems is, you know, not a lot of people are doing web service to person to person. They, they generally control the software on both sides, so they use the same platform so these bugs don't get caught, right? So it's good that this is a Windows 1. So we'll just guess that they have uh, wisdom generation on there. Oh, looks like he was able to get it. It's, wait, let's see. This network is so slow. Is Kaminsky talking now and doing his weird network stuff? No. Last night, okay. Was that good? Excuse me, sir? Really? He ended up at the hospital, Dan Kaminsky. Jesus. Okay, we're taking a collection uh, in the memory of Dan Kaminsky. Um, unlike Dan Kaminsky, I actually don't put in applause, pauses in my presentation. Do you guys think I should do that? Let go. And that's a whistle. Ta da Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, this was able to grab the WSDL, and it's generated, like I said, it has all the information you need to know on the service. These are different methods. This is just as if I was writing an application and I call a function that's defining my function. Just think of it as that, although it goes across the internet, right? In the web app world, these, were, these could be either like parameters in a post, like transfer money or do this, or it could be the URLs themselves, the, the, uh, like slash interest, slash get money, right? Um, so if I click on one of these, it tells me what was defined in the header and the body for each one of these. Uh, this has nothing, so that means it takes no, it doesn't take any input. Um, this one takes one string in the body, get latest interest rate. Um, and so if I wanted to put a value in there, I could put it in there and say invoke. This thing, uh, this, you know, this is meant for legitimate users, so it won't let you do things other than what they define. But like I said, people sometimes don't check very well, so it might be very possible if, you know, one way to, one way, a good way to do an attack on this would be to run Web Service Studio or Eclipse or uh, XML Spy through Web Scarab, watch the traffic that's legitimate, and then edit it bit by byte by byte. Remember, it's UTF-8, so it's two bytes per, per character if it's internationalized. Um, interest rate, interest rates by day, interest rates by day type, yada, yada. So this one doesn't require anything to invoke it, so I'll invoke it and I should get something back. Right now, it's going across the internet. It used the WSDL to generate a message that it thinks these people are going to understand, and it sends it to them as an HTTP post, and it waits for the response, and here's the response. Uh, it's an XML document. It automatically parses it for us. Um, like I said, this is not how you're supposed to use this, right? If I was another bank and I wanted to get the interest rate, I'd have some application that would do this automatically and then give it to a user. Or if I was Bank of Lithuania, I'd create a nice little pretty GUI to do this for people, right? So that's why this is all ugly. Uh, like I said, this isn't meant for human consumption. Um, but here it gives us all the data that came back. We can say request response, and we'll actually see... Uh, uh, so messages have things have the envelope, the body, the header. We talked about the header. The envelope's required. It has things like what version of soap am I using? What's the namespace? Stuff like that. Uh, and then the response, which is just you know, it's your response. Uh, the, I love this. They tell us the exact service pack version of ASP.NET. Uh, and then a UTF-16 encoded XML document uh, that gives all of the input that comes back. Just like if I called in a program, if I called give me an interest rate, and it had three things it returns. This will return everything, even if it doesn't have information in there. And we're good to go. So here's the WSDL. It's really ugly. You can see why people don't read them for something that's that simple. Right? It's all that WSDL. You have to define everything like four times. Um, and you can see why that might be a, a place that people don't look. So... I will do an attack and we'll use Web Service Studio for it. So to, to wrap up before we get to the demo, um, why do we have all these discovery methods? It's this thing called service-oriented discovery, more venture capital. It's amazing how much of the English language is based upon what can get you venture capital. Um, service-oriented architectures. The idea is that delayed binding of applications. If I'm Bank of America and I know most of the banks in the world use some kind of standard thing to, say, clear checks, then I can, not even knowing who those other banks are, go to a registry, cryptographically check that that person is who they are because it's signed by a, a, a tr somebody I trust, find the web service to do the transfer, find how to talk to that web service and talk to it. And you can program your software to do all this, right? Lots of magic pixie dust. It's a little bit scary. 
Um, but because this is so powerful and because you can automate stuff to do things without humans ever involved, it's going to be very popular with people. Uh, other than the UBRs, there's some cool third-party registries. Xmethods.net has a big list of like fun services. A lot of these are by people who are just having fun. Things like census data by zip code and stuff like that. It's a good place to play around if you just want to learn about web services. And then there's this thing called w, Disco slash WS Inspection. Disco is a lightweight doing a, a UDDI. Instead of running a whole server to tell you what my services are, I just have a text file you can read it in, an XML file. This was a Microsoft-specific thing. It's becoming now WS Inspection, which is going to be a real standard to do this without running a whole another server to do it. Our tool will automatically look for Disco files for you. Uh, like I said, this, a Disco file will automatically be deployed for you if you hit the compile button on Visual Studio. Um, and so those are some of the new issues. The traditional attacks that we've always had still exist, right? Uh, design flaws, the bad idea methods like we talked about, um, the same OWASP top 10 things, uh, SQL injection still exists, right? Although some of these things are using XML on the back end, a lot of them are still using, S are, are still using SQL. And so uh, just as we had in web apps, SQL injection will work. I'm not going to talk about SQL injection. You can go find Dave Litchfield for that. But the thing I will tell you is that the best way to do it is to, you have to escape those characters generally. You can use something like a C data block, put the entire SQL string in it that will magically get transferred by the XML document into whatever the string is, and then put into the query. Um, overflows and unmanaged code, right? Uh, managed code is the Microsoft term for things like Java and .NET that run in a virtual machine. Unmanaged code being something like I compile C++ for an x86 or a Spark, right? Well, there's a lot of a lot of people have a lot of stuff written in C and C++ out there that they still use. It still does the core of their stuff that they want to expose. And so all the vendors have cool ways of taking something that's compiled on my machine and making it web service accessible. One great one is called .NET Remoting. And again, I'm not beating up on Microsoft because they're bad. It's just theirs is the coolest and the, the easiest to use, right? If you have a com object that works and you know it can be something I think it has to support I unknown and it, it's like the same standards it has to be remotable like that ActiveX control if you have a com object you can just click through you don't have to write any code Visual Studio and say I like this com object I want these methods to be exposed to the world boop <laughs> magic PC dust and all of a sudden now there's a web service with all of these it takes all these inputs and gives it to a C++ program do you think that it goes and finds out what what the uh, limit on that stirring copy is, or what the, the I'm sorry, what the static buffer that goes to that stir copy is in that C++? Do you think it does that? No, it doesn't, right? It just gives it the information, just as a com object can be called locally. And so it makes it really easy for people to take something that's local and remote it. So .NET remoting, it's, it's fun. See it, see it in theaters near you in 2007, right? When people start really deploying it, it's a cheap way to do web services if you already have stuff written on the Windows platform. Uh, Java, you can do the same thing with like RMI and uh, local calls and stuff. Uh, it's not as easy, though. It's not just click, click. Uh, mistakes in authorization and authentication. Uh, because SOAP is stateless, people have to roll their own, right? It's very possible that there are methods out there that you find from the WSDL that don't require you, that don't properly check your access control before they do something. They take a parameter like, I want to transfer money from this bank account to this bank account. They don't check who, whose bank accounts those are. Um, like I said before, the audit discovery mechanisms make this great. Because you no longer have to go look for this stuff that's kind of crusty in the web application. You just ask the WSDL. And like, they're sometimes named really stupid things, like make me admin, right? Cross-site scripting. Now, like I said, this is not something, SOAP isn't something that you, you eat with your web browser, right? So if I get cross-site scripting coming back in XML, it's not going to run a script. But, and this is the big but, there's a lot of situations in which there's a web interface also to these applications. And so cross-site scripting is also still doable. It's just you're not attacking the web service itself. The exception to this being Ajax, right? The, the downside is it's not easy. Um, I mean, I guess it's an upside because we're all good people in this room. The downside for the bad guys is it's not easy because I have to write something that, you know, in Ajax, like in Google Maps, it takes some XML data and then it makes it presentable. So I have to figure out probably exactly how that's happening to write cross-site scripting to script that will actually run when it's transferred. That being said, unless they're doing filtering on their side before the information gets to me, it might be possible for me to do input through an AJAX interface one place and pop it out somewhere else. Um, another thing we've seen is a lot of these web services, there's a human in the loop somewhere, right? If I, if I go transfer money at a bank and I have to put a memo field in there about what my transfer is about, I put that field in, I make sure the transfer is going to die, I call up the customer service rep. Hello, how can we help you? We're, you know, dumbassbank.com. Uh, what can we do for you? 
well, you know, my web tra my transfer's not uh, working out. Can you pull my file out and up and see what it is? Oh, sure, give us your social. They pull it up. It's a web interface. Boom. Their own. Uh, obviously, that's a, that's a pretty sophisticated attack. It requires some possible inside knowledge, but maybe not. And if this is, you know, with a, if you have an IE zero day, or the way people patch IE and IE, you know, 90 day or something, um, and most enterprises, right, people are still writing IE5 and stuff, uh, then you might get root control of their box. So any questions on those attacks before we kind of move into the wrap up and then the demo? I'm sorry that I know it's a lot of talking in a row. Yes, sir. Did everybody hear that? That Apache Access allows you to take pre-written Java and just drop it in. Yes, Access is great too. Apache Access, if you guys want to play with web services and you don't like Microsoft, Apache, the Apache project has their own web service framework which is Java. It's, it's very nice. Uh, we're playing with that too. I know, I'm, I'm saying I'm beating up on Microsoft here because of the demos written in Microsoft, but this is stuff that everybody does. So, thank you, sir. That's a good point. So, we have a couple of tech tools that I'll show you. Um, one's really cool. The one that Scott wrote, the one I wrote is kind of crappy. Um, but uh, I'll pretend that I wrote the one that Scott wrote. Uh, the, the cool one is Whizbane. That's how you pronounce it. It is a soap fuzzer. It not, doesn't fuzz the soap implementation, it fuzzes the application behind it. It takes a Whizdle, right? And uh, you know you can go and buy like SPI Dynamics and Sanctum and all these like attack tools to attack web apps. The really hard part that those guys have to tackle in writing those is actually the discovery of the attack surface, right? For us, the discovery of the attack surface is easy because we ask it. And unless they're really smart and they're manually editing the Whizdles, the Whizdle will most likely represent the actual attack surface. Um, if it's not automatically generated to the Whizdle, it's probably not callable remotely. And so it takes a Whizdle, creates a nice little proxy, looks up what the type of uh, the types are, like this is a string, this is an integer, and it does nasty things depending on that type. It's all extensible. Um, it supports uh, SOAP responses and faults. Gives you a nice little interface. I'll demo it. And uh, well, not a nice little interface. It gives you output in a web page. Um, and uh, the future work we're looking at right now, it only works with the RPC style SOAP for all the really hardcore SOAP people in here. It doesn't do doc lit because of a bug in Python's uh, implementation of SOAP, uh, SOAPy, but uh, we're working on it. We're going to resubmit a patch to them and get it fixed. So once we get the libraries fixed, it should support, support almost all web services. Oh, here's Jesse Burns, my partner, who has also helped Scott in writing this and who uh, is always tragically late, but not on consulting projects. He's never late on consulting projects for all those people with... <laughs> Wait, I'll do a Dan Kaminsky. Jesse, ta-da! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the other tool that Jesse helped with, um, and that's pretty cool. It's okay. It takes a WebScurb as, as, as input. We use WebScurb a lot now. Um, it's a really good product. It's a web attack proxy, as probably much of you know. It's open source. OS does it. There's this guy, guy named Rogan in South, Amer uh, South America, right? I don't know where he is. He, South Africa, I'm sorry, not South America. That's it, ECA, right? Um, who works on it, and Jesse submitted patches and stuff. Jesse likes to run it in Eclipse, in debug mode, like in real time. He's pretty hardcore about that. Um, but anyway, it's really cool, and we use it a lot, and WizMap is not really for finding web services that are out there. WizMap is useful for situations in which I have something that already talks over a web service. So maybe I... Let me think of something. So back in the B2B, when I was talking about places web services are being used, there's a point on the slide about OFX, which is the standard. Anybody here use Quicken or Money? Okay, you're not going to raise your hands, but there are people in here who use Quicken to Money to manage their money. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that OFX is the standard by which it transfer, it talks to banks when you say update my accounts and it gets your American Express information. That's called OFX. The next version of OFX is based on SOAP, right? So say I have a client like that. I have something that's been shipped to me and uses a web service on the back end, and I want to reverse engineer it. So I'll put Web Scarab, I'll set my, my HTTP proxy, put Web Scarab on it, and watch that traffic because it goes up from Quicken up to Chase and MBNA and American Express and stuff, right? Those don't, don't go through Quicken. Uh, Intuit just tells Quicken where to find those people, and then they go find it, right? And that's all over SOAP. And so say I want to actually, you know, research that communication channel, then I'll record it in Web Scarab blogs, and I'll run WizMap, 
and WizMap will go through and find all of the, the, the things I called, as well as the implied directories, and try a bunch of web service discovery requests looking for WSDLs and disco files and stuff, and then write them out to the disk. So I don't have to manually go through and find the things that are actually web services or not, and they'll find all the implied web services, and maybe they don't want their disco files out there, they just don't know that when they hit compile, it automatically goes out there, stuff like that. Um, future work, something we had to pull at the last minute because it wasn't working. Uh, we're trying to get to find UDDI servers when you get a, a zipper range or maybe even an NMAP XML file, right? Because they are web server. They're, you have to do kind of a NICTO kind of thing where you get a UDD, where you look at a web server and you ask it, you know, for different URLs that mean that it's a, it's a UDDI server. That's going to be very powerful because, like I said, there are enterprises out there that have these exposed. Just don't tell people about it. Don't register them in UBRs. Um, just tell their, their partners about it. And then hopefully one day we'll integrate it with Wizbane so you can run it against, you know, the people that you have a legal ability to pen test against, and then you can restrict it based on a regex to only be within their domain, and it will go find the web services and then automatically attack them. You run it overnight, and then, you know, your two-week engagement's done in an hour and a half, so. Okay, tying it all together, I think we kind of talked about this. I can go to a UBR, I can attach a UDI server, ask for the services. I go ask, you know, dumbbank.com, give me all your web services. I ask that service, give me your WSDL. It gives me the WSDL. I look at the, the dangerous methods. I run WSBANG to try all of those. I find an XML injection. I use XML injection uh, to change the user ID, and I become whoever I want. So a question here is, do our, the old bugs still relevant? Now, a lot of people here would argue that OWASP top 10 was never relevant, or that OWASP top 10 is actually saying the OWASP top 4 in 10 different ways. But it, it turns out that it is, right? These are still bugs that exist in our world. You still have to validate input. Access control is still a problem. Authentication and session management is a problem. Like I said, that doesn't, the SOAP doesn't give that to you. You have to think about it yourself. Um, cross site scripting, less of a problem, but a problem if there's ever a web interface, and certainly a problem in AJAX applications. Um, injection flaws and buffer overflows. Buffer overflows, you know, things like .NET remoting uh, make that kind of stuff a reality because people might get lazy and not rewrite their stuff. Uh, injection flaws, SQL injection, next path injection. This is worse now because we've added all these new protocols that are spoke on the back end, so we have new things to try. Um, fortunately, almost all of those things use a single quote, so it makes fuzzing really easy for them. Um, insecure storage, denial of service, insecure configuration management. I think we proved that denial of service is still a pretty big issue. So the conclusion before we get to the demo. Um, web services are very powerful. They're easy to use. They're fun to use. They're, it's fun to go out and get a book and write 20 lines of code and have it do something like get me census data and then plot it onto a map. That's really, really cool. But because of all that, they're really, really dangerous, right? Um, because, especially because of the ease of use on the developer side. Um, there's a lot of security work that needs to be required. You know, these people are writing these web with security standards, but I don't think a lot of security people are looking at them. And so those things need to be inspected. Uh, we need better attack tools from everybody to help develop. Uh, we GPO'd our, our web service stuff, so we're looking for people to help us with that stuff. Um, I guess we'll start a source for project or something, so you can do that. Um, we need people to find the best practice for development. Nobody knows how to write secure web services. That's one of the problems here. Uh, you can go and buy 20 books now on writing a secure web app, but you can't buy one and write a secure web service. You buy all the books that say securing web services, it's all about the encryption and stuff like that. That's not a bad thing. That's something people care about, but it has nothing to do with injection attacks and stuff like that. Um, and then we need for people to settle up and stop getting greedy and build this PKI inf infrastructure before people start deploying and moving my credit reports um, over these systems. And then with our shameless plug slide, um, we are hiring. If you are a researcher or consultant, please send your resume to careers.com. And a shout-out to all these people. I mean, sorry, I'm a professional. It's not a shout-out. It's a thank you. My, my brothers wanted me to know how many people here know Leroy Jenkins. Okay. That's a pretty good number. Okay, any questions before we get into the demonstration? Yes, sir. That's an excellent point, and I'm, I'm sorry I glossed over that. It was in the slide, but I didn't say it. Yes, the right thing to do is if you, if your web service you're putting out on the internet and you don't want anybody in the world to talk to it, it you just want like a partner just to email them the whistle. Yes, um, turn off the auto 
uh, mechanisms to publish the whistles and just email them. That's that's the best protection against that kind of stuff. Makes it much harder if you don't have the whistle. There aren't built-in stuff in soap just to ask for all the methods, right? That's the method that's supported, and people do that. If you guys, if you go drop uh, Google Maps into Web Scarab and find out what web service they're talking to and ask it for a whistle, it's not going to give you one. So there's certainly people that understand that. That's also something because if you don't want people using your service, if you're the way you get people to, to use your service is to mail them a whistle. Um, or you don't want people like scraping it, like eBay and stuff, um, so that you know they, they make money off of your work. Uh, then that's something you do too. Google API is probably one of the, the coolest web service interfaces out there. See Johnny Long's talk. Any other questions before we move on to uh, me messing up the demonstration? And you people laughing. Okay, I'm I'm really sorry that there's so much talking in a row. We, we got to get better at putting lots of demos in there. I'm sorry. So here we have a. I don't know if I can do this in 800 by 600. A virtual PC of Windows 2003. It's got a web service on it. This the exact same web service is currently running on wsdemo.isecpartners.com. If you're online right now and you want to play with it, or if you you go home and you want to try some of these tools, um, you're welcome to do attacks. I'm letting you do attacks against wsdemo.isecpartners.com. So going to be the only site that's going to say that. Um, so like we talked about before, there's this cool thing called WS Studio. Uh, I'll run it here. I'm going to point it at the web service. It's very, very simple. Oh, I don't want to go to the internet. No, it's, fine. it's got one user, or one method. Log on user, right? So this is simulating maybe we're bank, and the first thing you do is log in before you get your account balance and stuff. And it takes a string username and a string of password. Okay. So say I've been hired to pen test this. What am I going to do first? And let's pretend this is like one of those more complicated ones. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of methods here. I want to see if, if there are any vulnerabilities. And so I'm going to do that through. Using whizbang to, to do the initial thing. So whizbang.py, it should just it should tell me, yeah. So we're big on documentation and GUIs because we're privately funded and we have no venture capital. Uh, if you want GUIs, go to Foundstone. They, they excel at that kind of stuff. Um, so whizbang, you give it an URL. This isn't descriptive enough. You have to give it an URL that gives it a whizzle. It can also point to a local file. So I am going to give it the URL of the whizzle I grabbed. <laughs> this is why our partner Hamanchu, who spoke at Black Hat, he record he video records all his demos, which is I'm starting to really appreciate how smart that is. That's not a real demo if it's videotaped. All right. Okay. All right, because I spend an hour and a half convincing you I'm smart and then I can't type. So <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you. Is that a little more readable? Okay, great. So, running it with an URL that should give me a WSDL. Okay, I run it. It pulls down the WSDL. I didn't know that happened real fast. It runs a bunch of tests. It does this by looking up in a XML file at task, which I'll show you in a second. The type, you know, in a SOAP, you define types. You can do simple types, which are things like string and number. You can define complex types, which means you define a type can actually, it can actually be an XML document itself and stuff like that if you want to do really cool extensible stuff or binaries. Um, we don't support those yet, just simple types. That covers probably 90% of web services. So it looks up what the type is, like a string, and it looks up in the XML file the things we want to try, and it tries those things. And these are all the things that get tried on that one method. And it, then it reads the response, and this response comes back in the SOAP message is made pretty. And here we have something that says SOAP fault. So I click here, and it gives me the what actually ran. So outbound, here's my HTTP he headers. I set the SOAP action head header. Um, kind of glossed over this, but there may be, we have seen vulnerabilities in, in being able to set the SOAP action header to, to different than actually what the, the method is in the SOAP message. Something to check for. Um, and then within the body, we say log on user. 
the namespace is this namespace. This is the encoding yada yada. And then these are supposed to be, they're not indented, but they're children to this. The username and the password strings. And what was our username here? Anybody see it? It's a single quote. Right, and the pa password was default. And so the response was, to find this XML document, oh, I threw an exception. Okay, this is a fault because it's a SOAP fault. Gives me the nice little system trace of all the things that got called. Now, this is like 50 lines of C sharp that's running on the other side. Look at all of the methods that get called in a row to, to parse that. Look at this. That's all, that's, every one of those is a, is a function that we went through to call this. So that's, there's a lot of pixie dust there, right? And then it gives me Actually, we'll do this the pretty way, which is if, if I got this, I would do it myself then in this. So I'll try it. I say my, my password, my username to quote. Single quote. I'm doing it. Oh, exception. This isn't a local exception. It just passes through a soap fault as an exception on your side, and I go to request response. Oh, great. Yeah, that's not what it's supposed to say. Yeah, thank you. Right, I need to have something in password so it doesn't. Ah, thank you. So I guess hope fault back. Servers enabled to process a quest. And what does that look like to you? XPath. So, what was it, sir, that I'm going to try next? The winner of Frack. That's correct. Let's give a round of applause for that. Ta-da! Thank you, sir. Single quote, or one equals one, or single quote, single quote, that's not a double quote, equals single quote. Spaces are significant, yes, sir. Oh. I assume the pauses in his human communication between words were meant to represent the symbol also known as a, a space, when encoded in UTF-8. So we'll, we'll let him keep the frack. <laughs> and string results successfully logged in on user ID, user ID 3, Henry Ackerman. So that was an XPath injection. Why was it, why was it this user? What, what's special about this user, do you think? He was the last guy, right? So the, when they referenced the, the, the list, they probably asked for the last thing in the list. Right, which you do with a negative one in Python. So they asked for index never negative one, and you can either ask for the first thing or the last thing. Generally, I should get the same thing, right? And they asked for the last thing in the list. Maybe they went to this talk and they thought it was enough. They weren't paying attention to this part, just the last hour and a half, and they thought it was enough just to ask, you know, to not ask for the first one because that first person might be a, a user. So I'm logged in, and this is good, but nobody wants to stop here, right? This is where you stop if you're like a, a real second tier hacker, right? Oh yes. I'm throwing it out there. That's right. I said it. So what do I want to do? Right, I could do user ID equals one, but although I do know how the XML file is, is, is laid out, that's kind of cheating. What's another way to do it? So let's go back to our string. Let's say it is pretty close. It's not exactly the string, right? We, we did see what the string was, but we just because we know what the injection string was doesn't mean we know exactly what's in the XML document, right? Unless it references it right in that path, uh, the XPath string. And so this bottom one, what else could I do other than ask for user ID equals one? It's actually simpler than that. Name equals admin, yes. Right, I can just do name equals or quote, 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 and get rid of the or one equals one because I want them to match the first one, right? So I don't make it a full tautology anymore. I make it a tautology only if the name is equal to who I want it to be. Does everybody understand that? So I am going to, let's say I've tried admin. It didn't work. And I know these people wish they were programming on Unix, right? So they used the word root. And I'm now successfully logged in as user ID zero, name root. Ta-da! Sorry. <laughs> 
if it works for Dan Kaminsky, he because co he comes back every year to Black Hat in DEF CON. So if it works for him, it's going to work for me, right? So does everybody understand what we did here? This was an XPath injection, XPath 1. This could work with either an XML flat file in the back end or a quote-unquote XML database. This exact same query string would work in an XQuery, right? Because, like I showed before, XQuery, I mean, the simplest way to do it is all you have to do is define the document you're looking up, which is the same as a table, right? No, no questions on that? Yes, sir. Of course, yeah. How do I use that to map out the tables in the database or the XML file? That is harder. It's, um, we're not there yet. You're right. We, Amit Klein worked on that, and his, the way he found to get it out was only through logging or logging off. He was not able to get error messages out that contained enough information, right? Like the traditional way of SQL is that there's a SQL statements that you can do. You're going to go Carl Rove style on them? Okay. I'm sorry. Could you? Uh, I'm, it's probably doable. We don't have that answer yet, and that's something that we'll be working on. And Mick Klein says, I mean, does it through that binary. I think now with XPath 2, there might be better ways of doing it. You might be able, because you can reference external links. It might be possible for me to reference something and then make the rest of the XML document look like it's part of the URL, right? So like people do cross-site scripting with an image tag to get a cookie out. When it hits my log, I might be able to get it out of a log. I'm not sure. Um, Klein looked into doing it with error messages, and he wasn't able to do it. I, still, I mean, the guy's disappeared off the face of the planet, so if anybody knows him, have him email me. I'd love to see what he was doing. Uh, but you're right, in, in SQL injection, there are the, the you know, 19 commands you can probably do in a row that through the error messages you can map out the, the not the tables, but the, the, the nodes. Okay, well, since we got a second, I'm just going to do a quick demo of WizMap. Which I'll, since I learned, set it up without you guys seeing it. <laughs> okay, so this is WizMap. Compiling it. Okay. Shoot, that's going to be hard to see. So if you run it with dash H, it says you can do all these things. Ask for WSDLs, ask for discos, uh, store them locally, verbose. I'm going to ask it to do everything. I'm running in a directory with a web scarab conversation log. Although if you have it in a sub directory, that's fine too. Right. It'll, it'll search all the directories for web scarab logs. Anybody, who here uses web scarab? Decent number. I, I recommend you guys use it. Um, anyway, as you can see, there's no dash u anymore. We had to pull that out, which is a, one of the great tragedies in my life. Sorry. And I'll run wizmap.py dash wizdles slash dash discos, write out the files, and do it verbosely. And um, I just generated these, these logs by kind of uh, cheating and going to things that I thought would have different types of web services, although I didn't know all of them, but I knew these were different web services I was going to. Like I said, this is not useful for blind. This is useful for reverse engineering something that uses web services. And if the, the network actually worked here at DEF CON, uh, you would see that it would find multiple whistles and discos here and then write them to the local disk. In the, which are already written, one.disco, one.whistle, two.disco. Wow, okay. Okay, so it did one test. While that's going, I'll show you one of those. So this is one of the things that when I ran it in my hotel room, it pulled down. This is the WSDL for a census data. So do you think the programmer read that whole thing before it got published to the internet, looking for all the methods that he felt were, would be too dangerous to publish to everybody? Probably not. I'm not, I'm not gonna, you, that's for you to explore yourself, sir. I'm not gonna, 
So you can see it's doing some tests. It's looking for, it's asking for question mark Wizdles. It's asking for question mark Disco. It's also looking for default Disco URLs, and it's about to find one. And like I said, Disco is like UDI. It doesn't define a web service. It defines the services you're publishing through a web server instead of running your UDF server. Okay, so open questions or comments. Is this useless? Do you guys think you'll never run into this? Any, any more questions from everybody? Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll do Spot the Fed.